started. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our third webinar in the 2021 Earth Science Information Partners Innovation Webinar Series, which follows ESIP's 2021 year theme of leading innovation in Earth Science Data Frontiers. This webinar series, which is generously sponsored by our partner SAIC, explores examples of innovation, stories of developments that didn't seem innovative at the time, but were innovative in retrospect, and also examples of what innovations are needed in the future from a variety of different perspectives. Today, we're delighted to feature NOAA's Precision Marine Navigation Program and how they are developing next generation data services for the maritime community. A couple of logistics notes before we proceed. There will be a Q&A component toward the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please pop them into the chat box here in Zoom and we will address them as time allows. I also wanna remind everyone that this session is being recorded and it's going to be posted on the ESIP YouTube channel after it's over so you can revisit it, and revisit it and tell others to take a look as well. If you're not familiar with ESIP, we wanted to say welcome to you. Um, we're glad that you've joined us for this webinar. ESIP strives to be a leader in promoting the collection, stewardship, use, and reuse of our science data, information, and knowledge, and to be responsive to societal needs. For more than 20 years, ESIP has helped members of the Earth Science Data community to find each other, to work together across traditional boundaries, to leverage each other's expertise, and to work together on common data challenges and also opportunities. ESIP is primarily funded by NASA, NOAA, and the USGS, and we have over 170 different partner organizations that span the federal, private, and academic sectors. To help our science data professionals to work together, ESIP fosters rich collaborative experiences, including numerous community-driven virtual collaboration, the ESIP Lab, which supports the development of innovative applied earth science technologies, and two annual conferences. You can see here that our next meeting will be in July online. And the agenda, from my perspective, and I think for many others, is very exciting. It includes over 40 uh, community contributed breakout sessions on topics like data stewardship, geosemantics, cloud computing, AI, machine learning. We also have four plenaries, including one on data from the Mars Exploration Program. There will also be numerous uh, networking opportunities. So I hope you've heard at least one thing here that piques your interest, and we encourage you to join us if you can. So without any further delay, I'm excited now to welcome our speakers. I'll tell you a little bit about both of them and then pass it to them. Uh, Julia Powell is the Chief of the Office of Coast Survey Navigation Services Division, uh, which provides a focal point for customer requests on charting issues, short-term hydrographic surveys, and nautical publications such as Coast Pilot. The division coordinates and represents the Office of Coast Survey at constituent events such as harbor safety meetings, waterways management meetings, and more, as well as standing up NOAA's Precision Marine Navigation Program. Julia holds a degree in geological sciences from Cornell University and a master's in information systems from the University of Maryland. She's the chair of the International Hydrographic Organization's S100 working group that's working on the framework standard that underpins next generation navigation products, such as underkeel clearance management, high resolution bathymetry and other integrated products. John Kelly is a meteorologist and coastal modeler with NOAA National Ocean Services Coastal Marine Modeling Branch within the Coast Survey Development Lab. He holds a PhD in Atmospheric Sciences from The Ohio State University and a Master's in Meteorology and a Master's in Public Administration from Penn State University. He's involved in the development, testing, and implementation of the National Ocean Services Operational Mo Numerical Ocean Forecast Modeling Systems for estuaries, the coastal ocean, and the Great Lakes. He's also the project manager for NOAA's Now Coast, an operational GIS-based web mapping portal to real-time coastal observations, warnings, and forecasts. And he's the project manager for NOAA's Precision Marine Navigation Data Processing and Dissemination System. So um, I hope that you'll join me in welcoming both Julia and John here today. Now over to them. Thank you, Megan, and also I'd like to thank um, ESIP for asking us to um, present at this webinar. So hopefully um, you can see my screen. Yes, it looks great. Thank you. Um, so I'm John and I are going to give a talk about um, the NOAA's um, Precision Marine Navigation Program, where we're developing our next generation data services for the maritime community. Uh, 
Um, so really what we're looking at is, you know, we like to start off every presentation with a sort of what is our definition of precision marine navigation. And for context of our program, it's really about the ability of a vessel to safely and efficiently navigate within the U.S. exclusive economic zone and operate in close proximity to the seafloor, bridges, narrow channels, and other marine hazards. So the, the purpose of our program is, is that, you know, in our, our experience in reaching out to our various stakeholder communities, especially within the navigation um, sector, is that mariners actually use multiple devices and systems to get NOAA data, um, and that can range from an expensive commercial equipment called ECTIS, um, which is electronic chart display and information systems, which is required by large commercial shipping engaged in international voyages, um, at, all the way down to using your laptop computer to tablets and cell phones. Um, then the other problem with that in terms of getting the data onto those systems is that, that our data, especially NOAA data, that's useful for the navigation community is an encoded in uh, multiple different um, formats, none of which are actually navigation standards, so they can't actually be ingested into many of these systems to be legally allowed for use um, for voyage planning and route monitoring. Um, and then the other issue that we found is the data is actually spread across various line offices within NOAA, um, websites and various data services. And I think if a lot of you have tried to scrape different types of NOAA data, you'll find that you know, it, it's housed under different line offices um, and in different um, places. But the problem is, is, is when mariners are coming into port, they don't have time to actually try and find where all the data is that they need to um, complete their um, voyage safely. Um, you know, so they have this huge challenge in accessing and processing our navigation data. And our program's goal is, is to try and meet those challenges to stand up a dissemination system that, that is, has the ability for them to take our data in proper formats and put it into their navigation systems. So our, our, the, the thrust of our program really is about developing um, a, a multi-level service platform. Um, and we're trying to develop several tools and services that makes our data um, more accessible. And so the big key thing, as I noted before, is a lot of our different types of data that's useful, such as high resolution bathymetry, surface currents, water level forecast information, and then even weather, weather data, um, you know, they're not really in a standard that's applicable to be used in navigation systems. So we're really working on formatting our data into the international standards framework, which is called S100, and there's a slide on that a little bit later. Um, and we're building out, which is what John's going to talk about, our precision marine navigation data and dissemination services. And then our third big approach is, uh, is consolidating all of this into sort of central marine navigation.noaa.gov website. So a lot of people wonder what the benefits are for precision marine navigation. And we there's there's a lot of different types of benefits. Um, but you know, the key thing about making our data more accessible, um, it helps the mariners enhance their decision um, making process, which can which improves safety at sea. One of the big things that helps optimize um, routes and save fuel. So it, it can apply to the concept of slow shipping. Um, and then reduce lightering. And lightering is where, um, for example, um, before we embarked on providing high resolution data for the port of LA and Long Beach, um, ultra large um, crude, crude vessels would have to actually offload part of their cargo before they could enter into port. And a lot of this, and this was, this was um, crude oil. And so, you know, it's a dangerous operation, not necessarily, it's not environmentally friendly as accidents can happen. And so you really want to be able to allow the vessel not to have to offload cargo offshore so they can have adequate, what we call under keel clearance to make it into port. Um, and by providing all of this enhanced data into a navigation system, it allows for, you know, the, the, the shipper, the shipping companies just have more, have a more accurate picture of what the seafloor is. Um, and then it produce, reduces port wait times, um, avoids hazardous weather conditions. I think we also saw the effects of the um, Ever Given blocking the Suez Canal. You know, 
if there is one little thing, you know, that causes, you know, it can cause a huge disruption to global shipping. And the goal of, of providing all of this data helps, you know, it makes sound and informed decisions. Um, you know, but these services can lead to increased efficiency and safety, um, which, as I noted, reduces emissions and environmental impact, but also provides a substantial cost savings. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of um, trending traffic um, through the news wires where the cost of shipping is, is, is skyrocketing, you know, due to a whole host of different factors. Um, but, you know, by being able to create more efficient routing measures, hopefully that may drive some of the shipping costs down. So when I talked about, you know, looking at it from a standards point of view, um, we're leveraging the International Hydrographic Offices, or sorry, Organization's S100 framework. Um, this is a framework um, specifically tuned for maritime data and product specifications. Um, it is leveraging the um, ISO um, 191XX um, series of standards, which is the whole G G G GIS set of ISO standards, um, but it's, it's more developed for the maritime community. Um, so it supports a wide variety of navigation-related digital data. Um, it enables um, the transfer of data um, between and among ships and shore facilities. So we have to be really cognizant that a lot of this is um, in a low bandwidth environment. So when we look at you know, our scientific data holdings, those tends to be, that tends to be hundreds of gigabytes. Well, you know, you can't actually transfer easily a hundred gigabyte file of surface currents um, from ship to shore or shore to ship, um, because a lot of times they're way out of cell phone range and they're reliant on satellite communications, which gets very expensive. Um, and what it does is this framework um, integrates and transforms that um, data into decision and actual information for maritime operations. And it's really tuned to be an integrated um, set of standards um, for display on navigation systems. So I'm going to um, turn it over to John, who's going to provide much more of a deeper dive into um, the um, processing and dissemination system. Thank you, Julia. So to uh, generate those data sets uh, using the S100 uh, framework and make these data sets available to the manufacturers of the navigation of the display systems in near real time, and then the file size is un under 10 megabytes, as Julia mentioned, so enable communication between shore to ship and among ships. We have developed this prototype data processing and dissemination system to ingest, process, encode, and disseminate selected NOAA hydrographic, bathy, oceanographic, and weather information into the S into the S100 uh, framework. Uh, the system was designed and deployed using a commercial public cloud infrastructure approach, open source software, and our own NOS suite of uh, open source Python packages to encode the S NOS and weather service products into the S100 standard. Our initial focus was generating S111 HDF5 files containing model forecast guidance of surface water currents from NOS and National Weather Service operational oceanographic forecast modeling systems uh, using the NOS rescheme coverage of its electronic nautical charts suite, along with frequently updating S100 compliant metadata, which is a requirement of the IHO uh, standards. Next slide. Uh, NOS, if you're not familiar with, our uh, forecast systems, we have implemented 17 operational forecast modeling systems for estuaries, coastal waters, and the Great Lakes. Uh, these forecast systems provide now casts or analysis along with short range forecast guidance of water levels, water temperature, salinity, and water currents out to 48, 48 hours or 120 hours depending on the water body. This is analogous to what the Weather Service has been, uh, does when running numerical weather prediction models to provide weather forecast guidance to weather forecasters. NOS started doing this in 2002, but the Weather Service has been doing it since 1958 on the weather side. The majority of these forecast systems rely on ROMs or FRECOM, which are numerical oceanographic circulation models, and they are forced by meteorological forcing from weather models, as well as boundary conditions on the shelf from global ocean forecast systems. Uh, these forecast systems put their output in net CDF on structured and unstructured grids, which are really not friendly for the maritime community. So again, one of our efforts here is to take that output from those forecast models and put into a format that is 
easily uh, ingestible by navigational display systems. Next slide. Uh, this is a high level schematic uh, depicting the data processing dissemination system. It's composed of several subsystems, including ones for data acquisition, processing, ingest, and distribution. Uh, it uses a loosely coupling approach. So we couple these different subsystems, which allows individual components to be supported and upgraded independently, providing maximum flexibility in the future as new technologies emerge, as data sets formats change, and as access methodologies change. The cloud platform uh, that we built this on is a natural fit for these kind of loosely coupled architectures since developers can weave together capabilities for different applications, functions, and services. Uh, the prototype system obtains data from the latest forecast cycles of the NOS and weather service forecast models, encodes the output into S111 HDF5 format, uh, encodes the metadata, and posts the data back on big data bucket, uh, which is uh, a NOAA's effort to try to maximize getting our information out to a greater audience. So we're getting the data from big data on S3 bucket on Amazon, processing and coding it, putting it back on the big data, and also providing map services and making this information available to the different manufacturers of these different navigational display systems you see on the right, whether it's portal pilot units, ECTUS, electronic chart systems, and also a data gateway viewer that we built internally that we can show you in a few minutes uh, as, with a demo. All right, next slide. So some of the core technologies I uh, use for building this uh, includes uh, AWS services and tools along with these open source software. Our lead developer used a framework to build and deploy the system cloud software and infrastructure using a combination of Python programming languages, Terraform and open source software. Uh, and you might be familiar with Terraform, it's uh, again, open source tool for building, changing and versioning cloud infrastructure safely and efficiently. The core technologies uses uh, Docker containers, Kubernetes, which is an orchestration uh, tool to execute multiple instances of containers across a number of machines, AWS Lambda, Postgres, PostGIS, GeoServer and Geo Web Cache in the future. Next slide. So this is more detailed schematic of the one I just showed you two slides ago. Uh, and I just wanted to use this illustration on the different, again, AWS services and open source software. I will briefly describe it. So on the left, we, we obtain the forecast guidance from NOS and weather service uh, forecast systems using either the NOAA Big Data S3 bucket on Amazon or different NOAA data servers, FTP servers, et cetera. In the middle, the process, processing subsystem uh, interpolates the guidance of surface water currents, which is our initial focus to regular horizontal grid and a specified depth in the water column that is important for marine navigation for the ships. On the right, another subsystem will generate the dynamic S100 compliant metadata and both the metadata and the model forecast guidance are posted again back on the S3 bucket on Amazon for the manufacturers to freely access and to provide us feedback uh, we really want to have them in the beginning of the whole process so we can get their feedback, improve the system, both in terms of the products we're generating with S111 and the other S100 formats, but also how is this a good way for them to access information from the S3 bucket. So uh, it's uh, been very good to be able to get their feedback early in, the, in this development of prototype and eventually uh, a future operational system. Overall, the whole system is event driven as much as possible. So for example, in big data, there's a notification, they call it an SNS alert, will essentially wake up our system and we start doing the processing of interpolating and coding uh, the output from the forecast system into the S111 format and then making that available uh, on the S3 bucket uh, for the manufacturers. Next slide. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we have built this gateway map to your it's a web mapping application to make it easy for users to discover, visualize, and download data sets from the S NOAA S100 product suite as it continues to grow. This is not how we expect the manufacturers to get the information. They'll be going to the S3 bucket and automatically uh, downloading those files and, and uploading it to their systems and doing their additional processing. But this is an easy way for them to know the latest status on we, where we are in generating the different S100 products and also for uh, to explain this to uh, uh, different groups within 
NOAA, different management, and also other federal agencies who might want to be in the future provide their products in S100 formats as well. So I'm going to try to do a demonstration here and I'll try to share my screen. And if somebody can let me know if you're able to see the Gateway Viewer. Looks great. All right, thank you. So I'm just going to, again, in a because of time, I'm just going to show you briefly uh, the system here. So this is uh, showing that the United States this is the uh, ENC rescheme tiles uh, uh, coverage area. It's actually just a quilt, uh, what they have drilled to make it more uh, easily to provide the ENCs to mariners as well as to update that in the future with a consistent coverage and uh, scale system. So I'm going to focus in on the New York Harbor. And I'm going to show you first the bathymetry, which is up under the S100 S102 uh, format. And you can see uh, using different colors and the hill shading, you can see the uh, channel, uh, different channels into New York Harbor uh, as well on the New Jersey side. And then we can superimpose on that the surface currents from the New York operational forecast system in terms of uh, different uh, colored. Uh, uh, vectors. Let me just switch to the proper forecast system. You'll be able to see it. So again, so you can see both the currents and the bathymetry, and we even turn on the nautical charts. So we're closely following the S100 specifications on, on color schemes and the ability to overlay different layers on top of each other. So it gives you kind of a feeling what in the future the navigation of the display system will look like. They can look at the bathymetry, they can look at the surface water currents in the future, they can look at the surface waters and also, as Julie mentioned, the S41X is the weather services product stream. So they'll be able to see current marine warnings and observations of winds and waves, for example. So we're just, uh, so again, I'm, again, uh, because of time, I'm not going to go too much further. But again, I think that gives you a feeling of what we're trying to accomplish with the S100 products um, and be able to create those products and make them available through the dissemination system in a timely manner for manufacturers to use and eventually be able to have these right on the on ships for both the pilots and the captains and, and first mate etc cetera, et cetera, to be able to use so if we you can i'll stop sharing and then we can move on to uh, the next slide and I'll, I'll i'll finish up a few slides and then turn it back to julia so again uh we have a functioning prototype. It's running in real time. It's not operational, but it is really updating constantly. Our forecast systems are run usually four times per day. And so we're processing them four times per day for both NOS and once a day for the weather service forecast system. They're available on big data for free. You are able to access, and I'll give you information on how to get to those files in a few slides here. And also available in, in several types uh, of coverage areas for your convenience. Next slide. So here is showing the different types of products we have available on, on the AWS S3 bucket at Big Data. So we have uh, the full coverage of the forecast models in S111 format. In the middle is our core product, which is S111 HDF5, uh, along with the uh, metadata, which is constantly updating as the models of forecast systems run uh, four times per day. And again, you can, these are, you see on there, you can see uh, tiles and so, the manufacturer can actually just download the particular tiles that they want and be able to put that on their display system. And then on the right is a future uh, that might be usable on future versions of their display systems. Uh, it's on, on irregular unstructured grid. So this gives a maximum resolution of the forecast systems to the manufacturers and to the mariners. So they can see, um, for example, the currents in the channel at the highest resolution that we can provide with our numerical weather, prediction, weather uh, ocean forecast systems. Next slide. And here is just a kind of a sample of the different forecast systems, ranging from the Chesapeake Bay down to the global real time ocean forecast system. And we're providing it on a regular grid, a core product in the middle I showed you last slide at 500 meter resolution and for the really large global ocean model at 8.5 kilometers. And you can see how many different files we're producing. So it's constantly working. Uh, around the clock, producing these files, producing these metadata, uh, again, to get uh, make them available and get the feedback from the manufacturers. Uh, next slide. 
And this is just information you probably look at your leisure in the future time. Uh, this is where you can get the information, uh, where you can get the, the S111 files from on Amazon. Uh, we have a, a very simple uh, S3 Explorer, which you can use to browse the, uh, the S3 bucket as it's, it was a typical folder a directory structure that you're used to and find the files that we do like by forecast systems. And again, uh, there's additional information on the readme file in the lower right that you can go and get additional information and you can contact us if you have additional questions. Next slide. So this is a team that uh, myself, Jason Greenlaw, uh, the lead developer, and then Aaron and Adam, uh, developers who helped Jason develop this system. And also we had a person on rotation from the weather service, Steve Gilbert, and assistance from uh, our own IT group. And Adam and Aaron are here today. Uh, and I unfortunately I had to leave early, but they'll be able to answer any kind of technical questions that you might have. Next slide. All right, I'm gonna turn this back to Julia now. Hi, thank you, John, um, for that, you know, really good in-depth um, explanation of what we're done to build out the processing and dissemination system. I think I one thing through the precision navigation data gateway viewer, viewer um, because of time, but if you actually click within any of those cells, it will direct you over to the, the gateway data gateway, um, the, sorry, the big data project bucket where you can download um, the data sets also. So there's two avenues of, of getting um, to the data. Um, so our next steps um, really are we're working to transition um, our dissemination system to what we would call NOAA readiness level seven, um, which is to functionally demonstrate the system in an operational environment um, and continue to disseminate our prototype um, um, S111 surface current um, forecast data um, and then eventually get that into sort of operations um, into um, navigation systems. Um, and then we're also continuing to develop and disseminate additional NOAA S100 products. Um, so we're working in the next two years on the forecast guidance of water levels into what's known as the S104 water level file format. Um, and then also to provide S102 bathymetric surface tiles um, for Hudson River, New York Harbor, coastal and coastal New England in the cloud. A lot of these, why we can't necessarily ramp up, I'll show you on the next slide but it, it is also pinned to the development of the underlying standards and specification. But also we're working with our, our sister, agent, sister agency within, sister office within NOAA, the National Weather Service, um, um, and helping them develop their, what we call S41X weather and wave hazards overlay project products. Um, and then, you know, the key thing is, is this, this is really um, a prototype system um, in the early stages of development and stakeholder engagement. Um, we still have to scope out what the operational logistics are for this dissemination system. John and his team have done a really great job of being able to automate um, most of the processes. Um, so we're not having to have someone hit a button at 4 a.m. to produce all the files. Um, however, you know, if something goes wrong, we still need to figure out if anyone should be on call to fix this because if this does end up in a navigational system, you know, there is that expectation of sort of just in time and having to be able, you know, to have a certain amount of uptime um, for, for these products. And then we're looking to launch our marine navigation.noaa.gov website. Um, As I said earlier, a lot of this is pinned down to um, how the, the timeline for the development of the underlying S100 standards are. And we work very closely with the International Hydrographic Organization to move these forwards. Um, so, you know, there's a big red line and this is when the next big edition of the S100 framework is due to be released, um, which helps fix a lot of the stuff that we're finding right now in our operational testing. Um, you know, so so the most mature of the products right now is our surface currents. Um, and so we hope to have what we would call a, a, an operational service sometime in late 2022. Um, you know, we've been working with our, our, um, our Center for Operational um, Products and Services, um, co-ops, um, on the S104 water level guidance. And then we have our own internal projects for high resolution bathymetry and then um, working with weather service on ice forecasts and weather and waves. 
So uh, as I like to note when I brief out my upper level and senior management, this is not a, um, it's going to be here tomorrow, um, maybe not even the day after tomorrow. Um, it, this is a, a long-term commitment that we have to make in order to provide, um, you know, a cohesive set of products and services for the maritime community that's really tied to how it can be used within navigation systems. And then lastly, what should be coming out sometime in late summer is marinenavigation.noaa.gov. Um, really what this is, is a central hub to just direct users to NOAA's navigation services. Um, and it'll provide descriptions and links to our different navigation data products and services. Um, you know, we're, we're really excited about the release of this. It'll have, um, you know, direct links to the data gateway viewer, but it also has um, developer um, pages on, you know, where to find more information about S100 and, you know, how to sort of implement this within their own navigation systems. Okay. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present at this webinar, um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Julia and John, and there's so much going on. This is a really exciting presentation, um, and I can tell that our audience found it exciting because there are some questions in the chat box. So we'll um, move to our Q&A component now. If you have questions, please go ahead and type them in. Um, and I will start at the top with the ones that have already been shared. So the first one is from Neil, and they are asking, are data downloads limited to the region specified by the cells, or can I request data based on a user-specified bounding box? Hi, Neil. Thank you. That's a, a really great question. Um, so what we've done is by providing that full S100 metadata, that users actually can script against that um, with their own bounding box to get the data that they need. So it's really about just in time and, and specific to different users. I think hopefully we would hope to have some sort of API to help facilitate this. Um, but for now, you know, we, we just say, you know, we've got this really full descriptive um, metadata that allows for navigation systems. They know where the metadata is. They know the ship's route. They can run the intersections and they can just grab the data that they need. Um, there, there was, you know, an example was given to me, you know, at one point. You know, if you're navigating from Norfolk up to Baltimore, you know, and it's a 24 hour transit, you don't actually care what the water level is going to be when you leave Norfolk. You care about it in 24 hours. So that's you're enabled to um, plan your route and then say in 24 hours, I'll be in the geographic region of Baltimore. I want the data then. Thank you. So next up, a question from Micah who asks, are archives of the S111 files stored on the NOAA BDP? If so, how long are they retained for? Hi, Micah. Yes, yeah, so these are navigation products. So right now, I think we are doing a 30-day storage. Um, but I, I, you know, because but at any point, we can recreate it if required um, because the uh, originating OFS is um, they are um, under what the National Archive and Retention Act, um, so they have a much longer archival rate. So we don't necessarily want to like double store things because things get very expensive um, in terms of storage. Um, so right now we're working on a 30-day window. Got it. All right, Susan is asking if you can talk a bit about the interaction with the private sector in the evolution of this effort. Yeah, so one of our key things, what we're doing is, is um, a really large stakeholder engagement. So um, two years ago, we had a small um, stakeholders workshop up at the University of New Hampshire. And then last year, um, because of, you know, due to the circumstances of no travel um, and everyone moving to a virtual environment, we actually opened up our stakeholders workshop and did it virtually over a two day period. Um, and we had, I think, about um, almost 200 participants across, you know, um, both federal but also industry. And and our big thing with industry is we're really reaching out um, to, you know, there's, there's two main sectors. There's, there's the mariners 
because you want to show them the usability of their data. But you really have to hit the equipment manufacturer first because they're the ones that have to actually implement the data so that the mariners can actually use it. Um, so, so we are doing a really big push of engaging that part of industry to say, hey, look, we're putting out all this lovely surface current files. And oh, by the way, because the U.S. doesn't copyright it, we don't, you know, have to charge at this point for it and things like that. So, so we're able to actually make it more freely available than other countries that are undertaking some of the same endeavors. Um, you know, so that hopefully helps that part of industry be able to rapid prototype it. And a lot of the same industry, they're also engaged on the international um, standards side, you know, and they're also looking for the standards to be stabilized before they put a lot of capital investment and implement in implementation. But, but one of the things that industry has always, you know, said, you know, things like surface currents um, or even water level information every country does it slightly different. And if they actually have to try and implement it based on a country by country implementation, then that system becomes prohibitively expensive and that no mariner is gonna actually buy it. And so that's why we make that case for moving with international standards is because that cost of implementation gets a lot lower because you have you know, 30 different countries implementing on that same specification and so that Equipment manufacturers have to just implement sort of one specific type of encoding. They, they actually understand the repeatability of everything. Um, so, you know, our, our, our big thrust is really reaching out to the equipment side um, because we really want them to be able to show and visualize and, you know, and hopefully it sells more units to the, the mariners. But if it starts getting onto the equipment and the mariners start seeing it, then they start clamoring for more um, data and then, you know, sort of helps with that public-private partnership and potentially we get more funding. Thank you, Julia. So maybe it's a good time um, for this question that I had, which is um, how will the navigation equipment and systems incorporate the dissemination system and have you done any testing of the system on navigation equipment? Um, so, they they will um, they'll incorporate it through standards, right? So they'll implement the S100 framework and the associated um, product specification. And the dissemination system is really about here's all that lovely data, here's the discoverability of that data through the XML meta the, through the, the the metadata, right? And so they'll be able to write those types of algorithms and be able to you know scrape the data and then put it and display it on their system. There's another key piece in addition to S100, we can really go into it, but there's a whole specification for interoperability, which is how all of the different data is stacked on top of each other with make navigation sense. If you think about as you load, you know, when you're an early GIS user, or even a super GIS user, and you get all of this data and you start loading it all up at once, it, it becomes a muddled picture, right? And so what we're trying to do in the, in the standards world is create sort of an interoperability specification that controls that display and layering of that data so it gives that the mariner a good navigational picture. Because if you start, um, if you put on, so for example, when John, showed you on the data gateway viewer, he showed like the ENC, um, if you zoomed in, you know, they started putting some of that interleaving of that data because you can't just put on the high resolution bathymetry grid on top of the electronic navigational chart because then what you end up doing is you actually end up suppressing the visualization of things like that are really important, such as ACE navigations, you know, channel frameworks, regulated areas, um, and other such things, you know. So there's there's a lot of um, different types of things. Um, as to part two about the early testing of the system on navigation equipment, there has been some, you know, there is a couple of test bed projects. Um, there's one that's being run um, through um, Navy funding um, through the um, what's called NIWIC, and so they actually have, they've been working on a viewer of, that you can download and that is a really strict implementation of S100, and so that's been very helpful 
and then also the Republic of Korea has a, a very large um, S100 test bed project, and I've been a and Noah's actually um, been a partner for with that um, through a joint um, project agreement that Noah and the Republic of Korea have, um, and they've actually done um, what they call sort of a navigation system a simulator. And then they put it on board one of their research vessels and then invited a select few of us into a sea trial to sort of test it out. And then when you see it actual in reality, then you start seeing where you have gaps in your, your standards and specifications, and then you go back and refine it. So that's one of that key thing is why we really want um, the equipment manufacturers to really start digging into this because they're the ones that are going to find the gaps. You know, because a lot of this was developed, you know, around the table and it's very theoretical. But now that we're starting to have test data out there, you know, it's really important about that implementation. Thank you for that. Just want to pause for a moment and ask if anybody wants to unmute and ask a question. I think we're um, the right size group to enable that. Any lingering questions out there. Oh, we have another one in the chat box. So I will ask that while we are reading is the approach to publishing forecasts to use a common time base and the onboard navigation software transforms that to a local time yes um and and i may defer to aaron um, nagel who's also on the call you know if there's a, a little bit more um, clarity on what because she, she's been one of the key developers in, in all of the processes but yeah so we do we do use um, a common time, so the UTC, because the navigation systems do a lot of conversion. And the same goes for datums also. Um, that's you know one of the big things is is that we found out with our operational forecast systems, especially with water levels, is that um, you know the the forecast system that that NOAA maintains or for the water levels, they're on um, model datum, whereas charting systems happen to be on chart datum, which tends to be mean low or low water. And so you actually, so we have to take our own internal model, transform that data into mean low or low water, so it can actually be properly applied on top of the navigational chart um, to actually adjust that water level. So, you know, before we actually release that data for public dissemination, we have to be really sure that all of our correctors are, are, are correct because then there comes the legal liability type questions. So um, I'm not sure if Erin, Erin's on, and I'm not sure if she may be able to correct me on the UTC issue. All right, if there's not anything else on that topic, uh, let's see, here's one more. Um, what about data consumers? Will they need to be updated every time a new data set is released? So, yes. Um, so for things like surface currents, well, I, I guess it depends, right? So a surface current forecast is good anywhere from, um, you know, anywhere from, you know, when it's released up to 48 hours, depending on the model, it can even be up to 120 hours. Right now, you have to think as you go forward in time, the confidence in that forecast actually degrades. You know, so I think it depends on how far along you are in your voyage, whether or not you still have you feel confident. You know, and then we apply something called uncertainty, and you know, it'll degrade that forecast um, further. So, so yes, um, you know, for the highest you know, the, the best surface current forecast, yes, you should have the latest data available. We say that for every navigation product, right? Even for an electronic navigational chart, you, and actually it's mandated by carriage requirements and by the International Maritime Organization, is that you have to have the latest products available to you loaded on board your, your um, navigation system, which is why it's really important we talk about the smaller file sizes, right? Because if it, all of this ends up in a regulated environment, they have to easily be able to get that system just in time, you know? And, and I will say the navigation community isn't necessarily used to dealing with things like sour time, but time time. The huge shift in the, the, the way of thinking on how they get data. Um, they used to order charts once a year. 
The questions just keep coming. Is there an international standard for bridge air gap data and surface conductivity? I didn't hear if there were S XXX numbers for this. Nope. Not, not yet. Um, I think potentially there will be, you know, could be a product specification for things like air gap and surface conductivity. Um, currently, the IHO is sort of working on their foundational products, um, such as the, the surface current forecast, um, water level forecast. But the key thing with water level forecasts in the next few years, they're also going to add in real time observations. And I think once we have a handle on how real time works within the S100 framework, things like, um, you know, air gap, which is a little bit more real time, um, that is, can be part of that whole discussion and, and transmission process. So, um, so no, um, but possibly eventually. I think it also depends on who wants to put the work in for it, you know, and the, the, the user community if they're clamoring for it. All right, last call. Are there any more questions? Uh, give a moment via chat or feel free to unmute. All right. Well, I would like to say thank you very much to Julia and to John who had to leave. This was really uh, a very illuminating webinar. We had lots of um, interest from our participants, and I'm excited to share this. A recording on our YouTube channel shortly afterwards. Um, I wanted to share a couple of quick closing uh, items. I want to say thank you again to our speakers. Thank you to our participants. And this will conclude our webinar for today. I did want to give you a heads up that we will be back in June with another webinar in the East of Innovation webinar series. Um, we will feature Evan Burgess. Evan will be talking about the data system and software development challenges for Air Airborne Snow Observatory, which is an innovative NASA research program turned LLC. Um, and Evan is their lead data scientist. So you can look forward to more information on that that will be towards the end of June. And then if you'd like to hear about the webinar series, our upcoming ESIP meeting and other ESIP news, please uh, sign up for our Monday update mailing list. I popped a link into the chat box that you can go to to do that. Um, and finally, just a reminder to you all that this webinar will be shared on the ESIP YouTube channel so you can revisit it or tell others to take a look. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, especially Julia and John. Thank you.